All right, good afternoon. Let's start the lecture. Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, screws, power screws, and uh, threaded fasteners. All right. And the objective is basically uh, uh, it's it's a different basically machine elements. Okay, so we want to interpret and specify the thread forms. Basically, understand the basic standard, the basic terminologies uh, related to uh, screws, power screws, and threaded fasteners. Right. And at the same time, we also want to uh, understand uh, what's the power, uh, what's the mechanics, particularly for the power screw. Uh, basically. Uh, what's the force and how much torque do you need to raise or to lower certain load? Uh, for uh, either the thread or power screw, so we wanted to know what's the stress distribution or um, what kind of combination of stresses that existed on the power screw threads. Okay, so basically, uh, you need to design, you need to um, uh, uh, analyze whether you have a, a safe. Uh, choice of a power screws or screws or thready fasteners, right? Yeah. So this diagram kind of show you where we are. So uh, right now uh, we are going to be here and here. So for power screw, it's uh, it power screw is a little bit different from uh, fasteners or uh, screws here. Uh, power screws is used for power transformation, rotation, rotational motion to linear motion, right? And uh, screws and fasteners are for uh, joining uh, third certain members, right? So, uh, here's a question here. Take a guess. How many fasteners do you think there is? There are on the Boeing 747. Ten thousand. One million. Huh? Ten million. How much? 2.5 million fasteners. 2.5 million fasteners, some of them are very expensive, right? <clears throat> so you can imagine how expensive the plane is just for the fastener itself. The whole stability and safety of the airplane can not just depends on the material of the uh, of the body, but also depends on a proper choice okay, of the fasteners. So, let's take a look at the anatomy of a thread. Okay. Uh, thread is very much like the worm gear. Remember the worm gear we were doing seeing, right? Worm gear basically says there's one, only one tooth. Okay, it's only one tooth. Number of tooths only one. So this is basically there's there's you imagine you have a piece of a thread, and then you wrap the piece of thread on the on the uh, screw body, and that's basically uh, the thread. And the way to you wrap it, you wrap it around it as a helical, basically a curve, helix, right? So that's how you have this uh, thread at here. So a couple of the terminologies, uh, pitch. So pitch is the distance between two adjacent crests. A crest is basically the top okay, of this uh, thread at here. Okay, so that's peach. So <clears throat> at the bottom here, that's called the root. Okay, that's called a root. And there's an angle called lead angle. So lead angle is the angle. Okay, basically, uh, lead angle is 90 degree minus the helix angle. So what's the helix angle? Remember, you have a helical curve, and if you draw a tangential curve at any point, we said. Is going to have a perpendicular. It's going to have a constant angle between the tangential vector and this axis of rotation, right? Axis rotation. That's called the helix curve, helix angle. So 90 degree minus that give you the uh, lead angle, okay? Lead angle here. Okay. So basically, uh, if you unwrap, and we'll see that later. If you unwrap, okay, the thread, okay, unwrap the thread from the uh, screw body. Is you you end up with essentially okay uh, sort of a triangle like this, and the angle at here that's the lambda, okay? That's the lambda. Okay. So the other um, 
important terminology here is the major diameter, mean diameter, and the minor diameter. So what's the major diameter? Major diameter is diameter between the crest at the top and the crest at the bottom here. So that's the major diameter here. Okay, that's major. Mean a minor diameter is the diameter between the root at here and the root at here. Okay, so that's the minor diameter. And mean diameter is the diameter between this major diameter and the minor diameter. Okay, yeah. So I'll give you a formula for the uh, for the mean diameter just shortly. Okay. And uh, there's uh, what else uh, there is here? There is also so-called uh, thread depths. So basically, that's the that's the depths between the crest and the root, right? That's the H over there. Okay. There's generally the chamfer at the ends of the uh, thread here, then 45 degree of chamfer. Okay. And that's basically uh, what it is. Okay. Yeah. That's the anatomy of the thread. Thread standard. There, there are, uh, are two standards here. One is basically ISO standard. The other is the uh, American standard, UN standard. Okay, so in Canada we also use this one here. But if you go to hardware shop, you, you probably will be able to find uh, either standards of uh, thread um, uh, uh, screws available. Okay, yeah. So uh, the the standards basically what they define is uh, it defines one of the things it defines is the profile. Okay, so what kind of profile? Essentially, what does it look like for the thread form? Okay, so number one is they're so-called basic thread profile. So basic basically means uh, the there there are two more thread flock. One is for the UN standard, one is for the metric standard. And both of these standards are derived from this basic thread profile. Okay, so this profile is given in the textbook. And for this profile, okay, what you're looking at here is so let's say this is okay, this is the uh, basically external thread. Okay, so this is external thread. If you if you think of this internal thread, basically uh, there, there's another portion on this side here, and that'll be the internal threads, right? So the basic one means you have the flat at the root and the flat at the crest at here. Okay, so that's the basic one, uh, basic thread profile. Okay, and then next one I'll show you what U UN thread uh, UN profile and a metric profile, and they are uh, basically have a certain rounded uh, root and the rounded top at here. Okay, yeah. So based on this, based on these uh, geometries, okay, there are basically different kind of dimensions at a different height. So then, uh, obviously, okay, from this root to the other side of the root, right, to the other side of the root, that'll give you this uh, minor diameter, right? From this side of the crest. Okay, to this side of a uh, to the other side of a crest, and uh, you will have okay this major diameter. Okay, right, and in the between, and that's the uh, mean diameter. Okay, yeah. So uh, the other portion, for example, uh, from here to here is half of the peach. So that's right, right. From here to here, that's the peach, right? Yeah, from one from here to here, that's the peach. Uh, some some other dimensions like quarter H and H is the depths basically from the top here to this uh, to the from vertices here to this vertices here right okay. so uh, you can derive certain kind of relationship as uh, what is the basically what's the dr what's dp what's the d so take a look at the lecture take a look at the textbook there so but uh, what we are really interested is actually uh, the the profile for the uh, metric series and the UN series here. Okay, yeah. So this one here, the textbook doesn't have the diagram, so it took me a while to find this one here. Uh, the textbook has two tables. One is table A dash one. One is table A dash two. I think the handout has the two tables. Yeah. On the second page and the third page. Okay. So for the table A-1, the calculations basically are based on this profile here, okay? It's from this profile. 
Uh, this profile, okay, it's rounded here and here, and there are some certain dimensions very similar to the basic one there, okay. Based on the dimensions here, you can derive what is the relationship between uh, dr, and this is dr here, basically minor diameter, and dp is the mean diameter, d is the major diameter, so the relationship between these two can be derived this, and that's what's shown at the bottom of the table a dash uh, a dash one. Okay, and that's what's shown at the bottom a dash one. Yeah. Okay. So, if you're interested, to just do some quick uh, calculations. You'll end up with this one here if you're if you're, if you're curious as to where this is from. All right. Now, for the UN series. Okay, there's a slight difference, just a very slight difference. So basically, for the ISO series, okay, if you do notice that, that this, this is a one six H from the uh, vertices here to the vertices at here, so that's one six. But for UN, it's one S. Okay, it's one S. So that gives us a slightly different formula for the DRD and the peach, and the DPD and the peach, and that's what's shown at the bottom of table A-2, okay, A-2. So, it's, it's a pretty trivial, you know, if you're, uh, if you're not interested in this, if you're not curious, that's okay, you can just make use of the table A-1 and A-2, right, and that's fine, right, yeah. Okay, but uh, uh, the, the formulas where they're from, they're basically from the two graphs at here. Okay, so what else does the table A-1 and A-2 give us? If you look at the, uh, the the two tables, there's one column. Well, there are two things. One is called coarse peach series, one is called fine peach series, okay? I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of that uh, slide shortly. But either way, under the two uh, categories, there is a very important uh, uh, parameter called tensile stress area. If you look at the table right here called tensile stress area. Maybe I'll just open this here. Okay. So that's a very important parameter. We need that for our later okay, analysis and design. So basically, uh, this column at here. Okay, this column. So this column value corresponding to certain major diameter for the thread, for the uh, screw here, okay? Different screws has a different uh, tensile stress area, okay? Yeah. So, how is that the tensile stress area uh, de derived? Basically, you use the screw, okay, to take a certain amount of load, right? Take some whether whether you already you may put, maybe put it in the tensile joint, and then there's certain kind of a tension force, okay, uh, will be taken care of by the uh, by the screw, right? So there's there will be certain kind of stress develop on the thread surface, right? On thread surface. So how do we calculate that stress? And uh, we know the stress equal to F divided by the area, right? Stress equal to F divided. Because the question is basically, what will be that area, right? So stress equal to F over area. So the area calculation is using this formula, okay? Um, it's not the area taken care of by let's say the the if this is a screw body and uh, that's not just area by if this is a d at here okay it's not area calculated so simply by the d and if this minor diameter here and which is dr it's not the area calculated by the dr it's the mean calculated using uh, the Calculated actually using dp plus dr squared pi over 16. So it's the mean value between the dp and the dr. Okay. So at is calculated using this one at here. Okay. Using this one. Um, if you want to derive this one at here, so basically the d average okay, equal the dr plus dp over two. Okay. Over two. And then the AT simply equal to pi and D average over 2 to the power of 2. So pi R square, right? Pi R square. So that's how you get this AT equal to this. Okay, equal to this. Yeah. 
Is that good? Yeah. So basically, the tensile stress area depends on what? Depends on the minor diameter and the DP, which is the pitch diameter. Basically, the pitch diameter right in the middle of it here. Okay, right in the middle. Okay, so like like the average here or the mean value here. Yeah. Uh, the column of the tables okay, essentially shows you. So, so you don't need to calculate the AT value. You, once you have the school, uh, you have the uh, designation of school, you can take a look at the table to find what the AT value is. You need this value. You need this value in many places, in the several places, in order to calculate the stress, okay, and in order to, to uh, calculate safety factor. Okay. So uh, just know that where you should get this AT here. So in terms of the coarse series and the fine series, uh, that's basically just a, a, a definition of uh, uh, the uh, thread form okay, on the screw body. So if it's a fine pitch, then there's probably going to be a very, very finely distributed uh, threads. My drawing is not good. But it's coarse, okay, you probably just have a you know, bigger teeth and a wider uh, uh, distribution, right? Yeah. So table A-2 is for UN series, okay, and uh, very similar to the A-1. Uh, the uh, only catch is for the first column, okay, when you have a, a very small screw, basically the size of the pitch, the meter diameter is less than one quarter. So the designation here, they use a number, okay. So you see zero to twelve, they use a the number right here, refer to the major diameter. But once it's above a quarter now, so you can see the quarter basically refer to this and that, right? Okay, so that's a little difference uh, in the UN series table. Okay, any questions so far? So good? Yeah. So uh, in terms of thread, okay, you not necessarily, you always just have a single thread. So if you have two pieces of wire, and then you wrap this wire, two wires, okay, make it uh, 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 close to each other and then wrap around the uh, screw body or uh, a rod. Okay, so that'll give you basically double uh, thread uh, a screw there, right? If you have three, then it's sort of a triple thread. Okay, yeah. But the difference is, okay, uh, for uh, let's say for this one here, uh, this is a uh, double and this is a triple, basically three different colors, right? Okay, so the difference is. If you have a nut, then uh, for single thread, so when you turn the nut to one turn, it travels the distance vertically. How much does it travel? If you have a nut according to this, let's say, let's talk about according to the uh, according to this uh, terminology right here. So if you have a nut here, then just turn it to one turn. Okay, just twist one turn. How much distance does it travel? Based on the terminology right here, the pitch, right? The pitch. Okay. Yeah. So if if it's a triple, it's a double thread out of here, then when you turn it to one turn, the distance travels is two times. Pitch right two times pitch. So now basically the distance travel vertically, the distance vertical distance travels is what we call the lead. Okay, the lead at here. We use L to indicate that. Okay, yeah. Is that good? Yeah. So that's that the uh, uh, first difference between uh, single thread and then the multiple threads. And we'll look at uh, calculations later, and we'll take a look at the difference in terms of efficiency and in terms of uh, uh, the uh, uh, amount of torque that you need to raise or lower certain load. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the other difference, the other one is uh, uh, you need to know is the thread has right-handed thread and left-handed thread. Okay. So how do you distinguish that then? Right. So if the right hand, basically, when you twist it, okay, when you turn it, when you turn the, uh, when you turn, when you turn a screw clockwise, uh, uh, the clockwise, or, yeah, when you turn it clockwise, and it's going to go away from you, basically. That's cool. That's the clockwise. Okay, that's right hand. 
Otherwise, it's going to be the left hand, right? Yeah. And where do you see the left hand and right hand? It mostly is right hand, right? Can you give an example of left hand? Pardon me? Yeah. How about the daily usage? Anything? Propane tanks, yeah. And there's, is there any left hand on the bicycles? The paddles, right? Yeah. So, whenever you have a so-called recession force, I think if I remember correctly, then you need a uh, left hand thread. So, how do we read? Okay, based on, let's you go to the shop, right? And you want to buy certain, uh, uh, certain kind of screws there, okay? So then, then you look at the labels, and then generally, I think we'll label it not exactly like this, but pretty much the same manner like this one here. It depends on what you're looking for. So this is basically how you interpret the specification, the reading in here. Uh, for UN, and uh, should, there should be UN S. For the UN, uh, UN uh, profile, so they read it like this. So first number to quarter, uh, this is what well, sorry one and a half, and then dash. 20, UNC, like a 2A, the LH, like this kind of thing. So first number here indicated is the major diameter, okay, basically. So major diameter in this case is a quarter, so it's a one half inch, okay, yeah. Second number here indicated is a 20 thread per inch. So 20 thread per inch basically means what's the pitch? One over 20, right? So 0 0.05 inch okay yeah now this is important because why in the uh, in the uh, assignments or in the exam question uh, I'm, I'm not gonna specifically tell you okay I have a thread I so I have a screw uh, whose major diameter is one half okay or something like that and the problem I would like to just give you in the question is just here is a screw with this much with this kind of a designation right you will have to be able to identify the numbers properly. Guess what? If you don't identify the number properly, the rest of the calculation will be all wrong, right? So that's the first step. You got to get it right. Uh, UN, that's basically UN profile. C here represents a course type. A course type. Uh, two meaning is a certain kind of a feed, and A here meaning it's an external thread. And the LH is basically left-handed thread. If it's the right, RH is uh, right, right-handed. Okay, yeah. So that's how you'd interpret this, uh, the reading out of here. Okay, interpret reading. So if you look at your table A-2, uh, A-2. So course series and 20. Uh, actually, zero one quarter, one half here. Well, there's no one half here, huh? Oh, there is one half here. There's one half. Uh, actually, I think I should change that because the 20 is belong to the, for the one half, where is the one half? Right here, right? So the one half, 20, that's actually U and F series. Can you see that? Right? That's actually UNF. Okay. UNC doesn't have one half twenty. It's a one quarter twenty. So either you change that one half to one quarter or you change that uh, UNC to UNF. Is that clear? Yeah? Yeah. So uh, I'll I'll change my lecture notes just accordingly. Just remember that. Right? So metric example. Okay, so metric one here. So it always starts M. Then the first number is the major diameter. Okay, it's the major diameter here. Uh, second number, they use six multiplied by 0 0.75. Second number is the pitch. So that's pretty uh, direct interpretation here. So that's the pitch and 0 0.75 millimeter. And then the rest of them, like 5G, 6G, there are certain kind of tolerance regarding uh, major diameter and the pitch diameter. And the last one here is uh, LH, whether it's left hand or right hand here. Okay, yeah. So uh, most important is this one here, right? Give you a give you a screw, and uh, what's the major diameter? What's the pitch? That's 
how you can take it from there. Okay. Yeah. So that's basically uh, some quick introduction on the on the screws there. Okay. So let's take a look at power screw. Okay. Power screw. Uh, power screw is pretty commonly seen there. We have a uh, you know card jack and uh, press clamps. Okay, so they are they are all basically uh, power screw. Uh, basically, what you do is you transform the angular motion into a linear motion, right? So basically, the uh, the power the torque input raises up certain kind of a uh, force. Okay, that's power screw. So this is the press. You already do a compressive test, right? so you can use this. Uh, this is the power screw structure. If you have, the, if you see the lazy machine, and there's a big power screw right here. Okay, uh, the thread, okay, of the power screw, okay, not this one here. This is this this one here is the lead and the ball screw here. So this is a little bit different from this. Okay, so what's the difference basically between this lead and ball screw here is uh, it has uh, th there's a nut right here. And between the nut and the, the lead and the, the screw right here, there are a series of numbers of balls in it. Okay, series of number of balls here. And the ball basically does this translation of this motion here. So it provides pretty smooth motion. Okay. Instead of a instead of a, you have a nuts here, that's basically a sliding kind of motion, right? But if you have a balls here, it becomes a rotating kind of motion here. So it's pretty smooth, right? But the only the, the only problem you got to be careful is generally they have a certain kind of a seals here to prevent the balls falling out, right? So you don't want basically you don't want the nut to fall off the screw here, okay? Otherwise, all the balls in it will basically just fall out. Once it falls out, then, then you can't reuse it anymore. Okay? Yeah. So uh, some sometimes uh, a very common application of this. Uh, uh, lead and ball is you use it as a prismatic joint in robotic application. Okay, so uh, you have the motor. Okay, drive this, uh, uh, drive the uh, uh, the shaft at here, and uh, then you have the link attached to this outside the nut at here. So basically, the rotational motion of the shaft will be translated into prismatic motion. Okay, of the uh, of the nut. Okay. One of my master degree to turn up the light uh, was to use this prismatic joint there and uh, design a controller for the, for the prismatic joints. So uh, uh, when I was designing the controller, PID control in the beginning, and not much experience, right? So basically, the control is not stable, and then the whole joint basically just whole thing shoots out. Even though there is a little mechanism in here trying to clamp it, uh, trying to prevent it from going uh, forward, but its force is just too big and everything just kind of falling apart. Uh, you can see all the balls in it just kind of falling on the ground here. And uh, trying to put it back, it, it doesn't work as good as, as before anymore. Yeah, it's actually quite expensive and it's very precise. Yeah, they're usually made by, by some kind of German companies. Okay. Uh, the type of the threads for the power screw is either you have a square type or you can have this ACME thread. Square basically it's a sharp 90 degree at here, okay? And ACME you have a certain angle at here, and that's always 29 degree. So 29 degree basically means if you draw a vertical line here and this angle here, and that's angle that alpha uh, is going to be 0 0.5 uh, degree. Okay, 0.5 degree. So they have the other side 0.5 degree. Okay. So uh, the difference between uh, square thread and ACME uh, ACME kind of thread, square thread has higher efficiency. Uh, however, it it does have a certain kind of manufacturing uh, dif difficulty there because of the uh, vertical 90 degrees that are here. Right. Yeah. So ACME thread is easy to manufacture. And uh, it's more mostly common thing there. Okay. Power screw mechanics. So what do we use a power screw? Okay, we use power screw trying to transmit power to turn the rotation into linear motion. So we need to understand basically how much torque do we need to input in order to raise a certain load or lower certain load. Okay. So here's a very basic uh, analysis of power screw. 
okay, mechanics. Okay, so a couple of terminologies on power screw here. Okay, very similar to the thread of the screw, their uh, previous uh, thread terminology. So you have the pitch from here to here. You have this uh, helix angle. You have the lead lambda. Okay, uh, suppose that. Uh, it's uh, taking certain kind of a load F at here, okay, and if there's a nut at here. So basically, uh, imagine there is a twist. You're basically turning the nut, right? Turning the nut here, okay, and it's trying to raise the load. Okay. Uh, if the top view here, the DM refer to the mean diameter, okay, refers the mean diameter here, and we use TR as a torque to raise the load and TL as a torque to lower the load. And there, of course, there are certain kind of stress on the thread. So we'll take a look at that. At the different location of the thread, what kind of st stresses exist? Okay, what kind of stress exist? Okay, yeah. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, power screw mechanics first. We're going to derive a very simple equation for the TR and TL in terms of uh, uh, the load F applied at here. Okay, free body diagram. So I will. Probably just only derived ACME thread because if you set the alpha to zero degree, you basically get the square threads, right? The square type of threads. Okay. So remember ACME. ACME basically the, the there is a certain angle set here. Okay, certain angles. So then, uh, if this is the basically if this is the thread surface, okay, this is the thread surface, and there is a little bit angle here. That angle, okay, is the alpha angle. Okay, that angle is alpha. Okay, now uh, what you do is you can do this. Basically, unwrap. So let's say you you look at this one here. There is how many turns in contact between the nut and the screw, right? Between the nut and the screw. So just unwrap, okay, the the thread, okay, at uh, between the contact, the nut and the screw here. If you unwrap that, and you basically end up with a wrap, right? You could end up with a wrap. So that ramp is this ramp right here. Okay, it's this ramp. And and let's say also you you here look at the ramp. Let's look at this right triangle here. So that's the right triangle. So um, this this side here, okay, is the it's the it's uh, this side here is the distance after you unwrap it. Let's say you have n number of turns. Then the total distance is n times the lead L, right? N number of turns, n times L. And if you have, uh, if you have, let's say, a number of turns, then how much is this guy here? And this is what this is basically. You have one turn. If you if you unwrap one turn, that distance basically is the circumference of the circle, right? Circumference circle, which is two pi r or pi d m, the the uh, mean value d m at here. Okay. But if you have n number of turns, okay, if you have n number of turns, this is going to be pi n n by pi, okay, times a dn at here, times dn, right? Yeah. And the angle at here is lambda, okay. Lambda here is lambda. So uh, technically speaking, the force, okay, between the nut and the screw, uh, we can assume they are kind of evenly. Distributed, okay, along this surface, basically this surface at here. Okay. To make it a simple, so we can we can assume that maybe there's just a force, okay, centered at somewhere, right? Centered force, okay, yeah. Now we used n number of turns, n number of turns at here, but uh, it really we don't really need the n because why? Because this triangle at here. If you get rid of the n here, just one turn, it's still what? Basically, still the the same triangle, right? With the same uh, angle lambda at here, lead angle lambda, right? So that's why over here we will be looking at this just one uh, turn basically, and uh, we can use L here. That's different. This is this D uh, D M in our notation at here, right? D M in our notation. Okay, so. That's where this free body diagram from. Okay, free body diagram from. So they call it, this is a P actually in our case this is F at here. And in our case we use a P at here. Okay, use a P at here. So that's the notation. And we also consider friction force, okay, at here. Friction force is in the 
opposite direction of the motion. So if you're if you're trying to push this load up, right, pushing this load up, then the friction force is this direction. If you're trying to lower it, then the friction force will be the other direction, right? Yeah. So the next job is now you have the free body diagram. Then what do you do? You basically you come up with the equilibrium equation in the two different directions, right? One is the x direction, one is the y direction. Okay, that's basically what happens next, right? Yeah. So here's a basically uh, a breakdown of the forces, okay? And uh, then all you need to do is uh, to uh, to write down the equilibrium equation in the two planes, and uh, which is basically PR, okay? minus n. So PR is the force that you're trying to to raise the load at here. Okay. Cosine alpha and sine lambda okay. minus F times N. So we're running out of the space it here. And then cosine lambda equal to zero. So that's the first equation here, right? In the this is probably in the uh, which direction? I think in the uh, y direction. So this is in y direction. So in the x direction, then you have f okay, minus n cosine alpha cosine lambda plus f n sine lambda then equal to zero. So two equations basically, right? Two equations. So based on the two equations, you can solve for the PR. Okay. Solve for the PR. Then the PR. Okay. Let's see. Do I have? No, I have this one here. So based on the two equations that are here, solve for the PR. Okay. Solve the PR. So you get the PR, which is this one and here. Okay. Which is this. So that's basically the amount of force that is required to overcome the load F and the friction force, okay, the friction force. If we're talking about it, it's the amount of force that needed to lower the load, okay, to lower the load, it's this spray body diagram, and the same that you, you can derive, okay, the PL, uh, which is this one here, okay, it's this. Okay. So that's the force that you required to lower or to raise the load. So what would be the torque then? Then the torque is basically PR. So the TR at here, the TR over there, is the PR times dm over 2. Okay. So you have this mean diameter there, right? And the mean diameter. So times the mean diameter, that's the torque, right? That's the torque, TR. And same thing for the TL. TL would be the PL times dm over 2. Okay, and dm over 2. So if you set alpha equal to zero degree, and you basically you get the required PRPL or TRTL for square type of threat, okay? Square times threat. Okay, so if I say alpha equal to zero, we'll give the square, okay, square type of threat. Like this, all right? Yeah. So, formula. Okay, that's what we're going to use in the in example. I'll show you how to use this one here. Okay. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, there might be a, a one little addition at here in terms of the loading condition of free body diagram. It's basically uh, there is another thing is you may have a situation is this. You may have a collar, so basically the power screw here, the middle the collar here, and then the, between the, between, uh, there's a, the collar is in contact uh, with a nut or a surface at here, okay, the surface. So basically, uh, beside the friction force, the friction, the friction between the nut and the screw, there's also friction between the collar and this member at here, right, this member. So all we all we need is we just need to add one extra term. So what's the friction force, or how much torque that is required to overcome this collar friction? So this is how what happens here. 
Fc is the friction friction coefficient times the uh, normal force that gives you the uh, a friction force. And then times the distance set here. Okay, one half of this collar and uh, uh, the collar diameter, and that gives you this uh, required torque to overcome this friction. So what do we do? We basically add this term. Just add this term to the equation derived at here and here. Right? Yeah. So now to summarize, basically your TRTL will be this and that. Okay? Yeah. So in the end, this is probably the general equation, okay, in terms of uh, um, in terms of this um, power screw mechanics. Okay. okay? Yeah. So uh, let's yeah, before we move on here, let me just one more concept here. There's one more concept. Okay. The other concept is called efficiency. Okay, efficiency. Efficiency is a concept you see that quite a bit in different uh, subjects. In your uh, electrical uh, power system, you have the efficiency, right? But overall, efficiency is defined as the amount of work out divided the amount of work in. Okay, that's efficiency, right? In terms of power screw, in terms of power screw, uh, we what we have. Let's use the TR for example. You you have you're using TR the torque to raise the load, right? To raise the load. So, how much load did you raise then? You raise the load basically. It's the F is the amount of load that you raised. So when you calculate this, uh, uh, when you calculate this W in, okay, that's basically two pi by TR, okay, so so TR by so one turn, right? It's TR by two pi. That's the amount of work into it, and the amount of work out of it, the system is F times the L. So you turn the nut one turn, and then uh, the load is raised by a vertical distance of L, right? So the work out is F by L. So F by L divided by 2 pi r, and that's the efficiency uh, here, okay, efficiency, right? Okay, so let's take a look at uh, an example right here, okay? Let's take an example, or maybe two examples, okay, yeah. So let's say I have a power I have a power screw and I wanted to compare okay, the difference between single thread and double threaded power screw. Okay. So um, let me just bring up uh, one of the diagrams in here to see let me see do I have it here? No, I don't have it here. <coughs> Let me see if I have it here. There we go. Yeah, so I need this one here. I'll bring up bring this one okay, over here. Okay, so this is the power school. So let's see. Uh, taking a square thread as example right here. So what's the geometry? Uh, this is the peach. And of course, that's one half. Uh, the height of the of the of the teeth, okay, is one and a half times the peach p. And uh, the distance from this side to the other side is a major diameter. And then from here to the other side is the minor diameter. And this is the mean diameter d m. Right. So let's see what do we know. Let's say suppose that D equal to 24 millimeter. The pH is 5 millimeter. And dm equal to D minus small p over 2. It's 21.5 millimeter. Okay. Okay. So suppose that we're using we're using this square power screw, square profile power screw to raise the load. And the load F is 3 kilonewton. Okay. Then 
um, we're we're going to consider we consider this diagram in here. Consider this diagram. Uh, there's a friction between the nut and the screw, and there's a friction between the collar and this uh, member right here. Okay, so consider friction. This friction F. Okay, the collar friction. Friction coefficient F C is 0 0.04. Then the thread friction. And F equal to 0 0.09. Yeah. So some sometimes we generally use mu for the coefficients, right? Coefficient friction. But in this case, you use we use a small f. Just be consistent with the textbook. Okay. Uh, the mean collar diameter. DC is given as 33 <coughs> millimeter. Okay, 33 millimeter. Okay, so let's say basically mean collar diameter, which is this dimension at here. Okay, this dimension. Okay, so now let's calculate a couple of things at here. So case number one, let's consider single thread. And then we consider case number two, a double thread. Okay, double thread. So let's compare uh, the difference at here. So if a single thread, so what do we need to know? In the formula, this is the formula we're going to use to calculate. Okay, we're going to calculate TRTL and we're going to calculate efficiency. So we need to know the L, the lead, right? The lead. So single thread the lead basically is the P, uh, which is five millimeter. For double thread, lead is going to two P and ten millimeter. Okay, ten millimeter. Okay. Yeah. So once we find this one now, we can actually just simply use the formula. To calculate TR and TL, okay, the formula we listed at the top there to calculate TR TL, because so we basically get all the parameters there, okay, TR TL. So uh, it's not much. So just take a look at the formula here. So right, we got everything F D M L pi F F C. So it's all here, right? It's all here. And then the alpha uh, alpha is what zero degree, right? Alpha zero degree, okay. So calculate that. So we get TR for the single one is 3.73.1 newton meter, TL 2.492 newton meter, TL at here, TR at here 9.76, and TL at here is. Uh, second, oh, uh, 0 0.13. Okay, 0 0.13. Okay. So, for this double thread here, if no collar, if there's no collar there, I'll calculate this again. So, basically, get rid of one term, right? The collar friction is gone. And I calculate the TL again. I can get my TL become negative 1.85 newton meter. Okay, negative 1.85. So based on the results here, what do you expect really happens there? First of all, what happens if there's no collar and then the TL is negative number? What does that mean? Yeah, exactly. Right? You don't need to apply any uh, torque to, re, uh, to to lower the load. Load can can lower itself. So basically, this formula here, if this quantity, okay, if this is quantity is less than zero, then the TL will be less than zero. Right? Let's say no, know this term here. Okay, know this term. So that basically means the load can lower itself. When the load can lower itself. It's so uh, it's it's called not self-locking. Otherwise, you have the so-called self-locking. Okay, so basically, you don't need to apply anything. The load 
uh, can be taken care of by the friction, right? So, so in this case here, uh, we have this okay, uh, not okay, self locking, okay, not self locking here. Second observation: What is the difference between single thread and the double thread here? So you see, when the single thread, you need what 7.31. And at the same time, for double thread, you actually need more right, torque to raise the load. For the single thread, you need more, for, more torque to, re, to lower the load, but you need less torque to lower the load. Right? Yeah, so this different set here. Right? <clears throat> so uh, the, basically, if you need a better self-locking mechanism, then you probably won't sh shouldn't choose a double thread. Okay, so you should say uh, a single thread here. So how about efficiency? So if I calculate efficiency using the formula that uh, uh, we uh, written it there, okay. So efficiency for single one here is 3.265, and efficiency for the uh, double thread. And by the way, what do you think a double thread? Do you think it's going to be higher or lower? Yes. Going to be higher. It's actually 0.89. Okay, 0.89. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So that's one example here. Let's take a look at another example. Okay. Let's take a look at another example. So we'll still use the square thread for the, for the for this example here, okay? And uh, in this example here, here's the question. Uh, P is four millimeter. It's a double thread. L equal to two P. The major diameter is 38. DM is uh, 36. Okay. So suppose that the nut, okay, nut is traveling, okay, at a velocity v equal to 51 millimeter per second. Okay. Yeah. The load F is 10 kilo newton. Okay, 10 kilo newton. And it will use, we'll consider this a collar. Uh, friction for the thread is 0.31. Friction at the collar is 0 0.15. The mean diameter at the collar is a 60 millimeter. Okay. So the question here is, what is the input power? Okay. So what's the input power? So basically, you're, you apply certain kind of power, and then the nut is rotating at the same time. It's raising the load F 10 kilo newton, right? Okay. Okay. So to calculate this kind of question, uh, we have to basically con consider what's the power, right? Power equal to what? The torque multiplied by what is power equal to? Hmm? Velocity? Uh, it's torque though, so we shouldn't call it a velocity, we call it huh? angular velocity, right? Yeah, okay. So, I guess we need to calculate TR and we need to calculate angular velocity. So TR is easy because we got our formula for the TR, right? So the previous formula, you got every basically parameters here to calculate TR. So TR can be calculated as 81.5 newton meter, okay? Newton meter. So what's the angular velocity then? So where do we get that information? Here, yeah, right? So the nut is traveling at 51 millimeter per second. That, that's the vertical translation velocity. 
So what's the basically angular velocity for the nut, right? Yeah. So the nut is v is this, and then the angular velocity is what? Is v over r. That's right. Do you say r or l? <laughs> over the lead l, right? Over the lead l. Okay. Because see, when you turn one turn, it's this vertical distance l, right? So uh, L is, is, is 8, so that equal to 6.75 okay, uh, revolute per second, right, revolute per second. Okay. okay, so then omega will equal to what? The 2 pi times the n, right? 2 pi times n. So that'll give us 12.75 uh, pi a reading per second. A reading per second. Okay, so uh, this is all in standard units set here. So then your h just equal to this 81.5 times this guy out of here. Okay, so the eight. No. So h equal to tr times omega, uh, which is 3,265 uh, watt. Okay, so it's standard unit. Okay. Alright, so that's a little twist in terms of the calculation of these things right here. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? All good? Yeah. Okay, so now let's take a look at the stresses on the power screw. Okay, so this is a little bit accurate. There, there are really lot, many different types of stresses on the power screw. So here's a power screw right here, and I singled out just the one portion of the thread here. So just imagine that there should be a thread uh, wrapping around the screw body right here, right? Yeah. Now what's the uh, dimension here? Basically, uh, this is the dm, the mean diameter, and this is the dr. dr is the screw body diameter here. There's a certain uh, torque, okay, basically trying to raise the load. And the F is applied, so suppose F concentrated here, okay? Yeah. So basically, F also uh, should be felt by the screw body at right here, right? Screw body, right? So, how many stresses exist, okay, on the screw body at right here? First of all, if you just look at the screw body here, okay, just look at the screw body, then there's F. Okay, basically it's a, it's a kind of compressive type of S, uh, F, right, on the on the screw body. Okay. <coughs> then, looking at uh, the surface of the of the screw here, so the first one here is called okay, maximum shear stress in screw body coming from the well, actually not from the F. I'm talking about the torque here. So maximum shear stress coming from the torque. So it's a twist. It's a it's a torque and shear stress from the twisting at here. Okay, so what's the shear stress from the twisting here? There are your your let's we call that uh, tau t. Okay, the tau t that equal to basically a uh, 16 t over pi dr cube, right? 16 t uh, uh, not t uh, tr. Okay, tr over pi dr cube. It's a circular one, right? Basically, it's a it's a, what t times uh, T times half of the D divided by the uh, uh, divided by what? Divided by pi divided by the G G value, right? Divided by the G value, the polar moment of area. Okay, yeah. So that's what you get here. Okay, that's the first stress. So essentially, if I'm saying is at this location, okay, at this location at here, there's gonna be this stress existing in that location. Make sense? Right? Or if this location there, right? This location. <coughs> okay. Now second type of stress, okay, is this axial compressive stress. So basically you have the F applied to it and there's a compression on the school body. So that's the second one, axial compressive stress. And that we call the sigma A, that's F over the area, okay? The area basically it's uh, pi the dr over two square over f, so that gives us a four f over pi uh, 
pi dr square, right? A sigma a. Okay. So basically, at this location and here, okay, right at this edge here, and it also has this compressive sigma a, right? Also has a sigma a exist. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then, uh, bearing stress. So bearing stress is basically imagine this, right? This is the thread, and you have the nut, okay, at here. So the contact between the thread surface and the nut surface, okay. So there's basically this bearing stress. It's like the K, right? The K surface. You have the bearing stress between the K surface and the hub or the shaft uh, case uh, K surface, right? Yeah. So bearing stress is the force, okay, uh, at this location and right there. Okay. So we use a sigma b for the bearing stress, and bearing stress is the force times a b or divided by a b. Okay. So it's the area. So how much area, basically, how much area in contact between the thread and the nut? Okay, between the screw thread and the nut thread. Okay. That makes sense. So you have the nut basically over here, okay, and there's contact, okay, between the two surfaces here, okay, yeah. So how much contact depends on what? Depends on how many turns of the thread are in contact, okay? How many turns thread? So if you unwrap this thread, you unwrap the n number of turns. Let's suppose you have n number of turns here, and the a b, okay, equal to how much equal to the length basically after you unwrap that and times the width right times the width okay so it's like this one here this is the width after you unwrap it and that's the length okay that's the length okay yeah. and length length is basically unwrapping one turn unwrapping one turn is is how much unwrapping one turn is pi times the mean diameter dm and n number of turns nt number of turns so that's the length nt times this by the width width is p over 2 so that's a b right that's a b so overall if you substitute that into it you get this number this formula here 2f over pi dm nt times p okay times p that's a bearing stress okay okay Okay, this is uh, how many now? One, two, three. And the fourth kind of stress is the bending stress. Okay, bending stress. Now, this is a little bit tricky here. What's the bending stress? Consider this, right? You have the force, concentrated force, right in the middle of the of the teeth that are here, or the threads that are here, okay? Now, if, if you think this is a sort of a cantilever beam at here, and basically this is a wall, and if this is F here, then there will be what? A bending moment okay, generated from the wall side, right? And how much is the bending moment? It's the F times this distance, which is a quarter P, right? A quarter P. So um, basically, the bending stress at here, the bending moment is F times P over 4, okay? P over 4. And if we're looking for uh, how much of normal stress, right? What's the maximum normal stress uh, generated due to this bending stress? So that the sigma equal to what? M times uh, half of the R, uh, half of the uh, times half of the diameter or R, and then divided by the uh, 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 second moment of error, right? The I. Okay. Yeah. So the whole point here is to finding the R and find the I. Well. This is what happens right here. So when you unwrap okay, the thread for the nt number of turns, you have this geometry right here. So the f is over here, and this side is the wall. Okay, this side is the wall right here. Okay, yeah. So um, basically, the i, if you look at the i here, that's the geometry of this surface cross section. So remember, this time you, your, your, your geometry cross section, you actually you cut it in this way here. Okay, you cut it in this way. Okay, not this way though. Okay, not this way. It's this way. Okay. Yeah. 
So your eye depends on this cross section. And this axis is your bending moment axis. So the I equal to how much? 1 over 12, right? And times B uh, H cube times B H cube. So what's this B now? This is the B, right? And what's the H? It, this is the H here. Okay? So this is your H at here, and this is the B at here. So that's how you can get the I. Okay? The I. And the R is basically half of this, which is a quarter P again, right? Quarter P. So the R is quarter P. Okay? Yeah. So substitute everything. You get the sigma. Okay? You get your sigma here. So I I call the sigma small b here. So sigma small b equals 6f okay, over pi dr and t divided by p, okay, divided by p. All right, almost there. One last type of stress, okay? Yeah, just a little, just a little stress power screw here. There's so many different kind of stress here. The last one is called the transverse shear, transverse shear. So basically that's the same thing. You have the F at here, right? You have the F at here. It generates a bending moment. When you draw the free body diagram, if this is a wall, you will have the shear force, right, at this cross section. The shear force generates the shear stress, and we call the transverse shear stress. Transverse shear stress, if you recall that, the distribution is like this. So zero at the top and zero at the bottom, and uh, maximum on the neutral axis, right, neutral axis. And because the cross section here is a rectangular cross section, so your transfer shear stress is three way over two a. Okay, that's the formula, right? And a v at here basically is the f. Okay, so v equal to f. The a at here, the a at here is the cross section area. Okay, over here, right? Over here. So how do you get the cross section over? So basically, it's this cross section. It's this area. Okay, it's that area, right? This area. So this area equal to one. Uh, one half p times the total length. Okay, and that's actually the same area uh, for the bearing stress a b. Okay, the bearing stress a b. So uh, plugging everything there, you can get your t r, your your tau transverse shear stress equal to this. Okay, so those are basically how many? One, two. Three, four, five. So five different kind of stresses. Okay, five different kind of stresses. Okay, exist in the power screw thread. Okay, in the power screw thread. So let's take an example here. Uh, here, here is a typical example. Uh, I will test you guys in the final exam as a type of multiple choice kind of question. So no calculation. So the question is basically just <clears throat> like this. So here's a power screw, okay? And giving you this location at here, okay? Basically the root, okay? The root of this thread here. Okay. How many uh, 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 what uh, how many type of stress and what kind of stress? What 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 are what are the name, name of the stress exist at this location at here? Right? Yeah. So, can you uh, uh, think about this? Think, think about um, uh, any kind of stress exists at this location based on the five different ones that we just derived? So, what do you think? So, you have a torque, right? You have a torque applied to it, and then you have a uh, you have F okay, over here. Okay. So, phi, right? So what do you think? Do you think uh, so? Let's t let's say let's from uh, from the uh, the beginning here. So do you think there's going to be this uh, shear stress due to the torque T R? Yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, what about this uh, axial compressive stress on the screw body due to the F? Right. Yeah. How about this uh, bearing stress though? 
no, right? Bearing stress is where it's that the, on the thread surface there. That's the root location, right? That root on the on the corner there. So how about this bending stress? Yeah, that has to be there, right? Yeah. How about uh, this uh, transverse shear stress? Why why doesn't there? Why it doesn't exist? Because which location here, right? And this location is what? Zero. Okay. Yeah. So at this one here, you only have uh, three different stresses exist at here. Three different stresses. Okay. So you can write down the three different ones there. And this is what I uh, actually I didn't write here. So I have I, I what I did is you can draw a stress element and you can draw the stress element and then put down the corresponding stresses on it. So this is what? This is that uh, axial compressive. And this is the, sh uh, the shear. And this is the bending. OK? Yeah. So given a proper different, basically, directions, the coordinate system, that's what you can draw here, OK? The stress element. Now, for more complicated kind of question, I'm not just asking the stress. Then the next reasonable one is okay. So here's the material, and uh, <coughs> here's a, here is the uh, uh, the type of a loading condition. All right. So uh, can you analyze? Okay, if this is a static case, can you analyze whether you have a you have a safe uh, or failure or not? Right. So what do we do? This is a 3D stress here. 3D st uh, stress element. So plug this in. Calculate the moment size. Okay, calculate the moment size stress, and then compare the moment size stress with what? With the S Y right over the required safety factor. Right? Yeah. So that's basically a typical uh, static analysis kind of question here. Right? Yeah. But most important is okay, and uh, and I have did this. I have done this a couple of times already. Basically, giving you such kind of a screw body and uh, such kind of loading, and asking you what kind of stress exists at the location, right? So let's take a look at another one here. And yeah, well, I give you answer now. So how about this location, right? This location here. So for this location, the only difference between this location and the previous example, the previous one has the bending normal. But doesn't have the uh, transverse shear, right? So now this time it has the transverse shear, but doesn't have the any normal now, right? Yeah. So that's the difference, all right? Yeah. Um, how about uh, this location here? Right at this F here. Bearing stress. Anything else? There's nothing else, okay? That's only one there, right? Yeah. Okay. So make sure you're comfortable with this uh, uh, the stress here, okay? Uh, in terms of the design, we, we, we're mainly not just focus on the not going to be on the focus on the stress on the screw threads. It's going to be actually on the uh, joint. The the stress is going to be used, all right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, just quick. Uh, just a couple of a couple of things here in terms of the fasteners, okay? And then uh, I'll leave the rest of them for the next lecture. Okay. So talking about fasteners, and uh, there are two um, major ones. Okay, sometimes they can be mixed. So when something called a bolt, something called a screw here, right? Yeah. So the actual definition or distinction between bolts and a screw, okay, are very sometimes they are pretty blurred. Okay. Yeah, but however, uh, in um, in general, when you talk about bolts, uh, you're talking about basically um, you use it in in connection with a nut. So the bolt will go through the member, then they're on the other side, and then you use it with a nut. Okay, so that's typically what we call a bolt. But when it's a screw, okay, <coughs> the screw can be used basically directly go into the member. And then the member has a certain tap on it, then uh, screw it on the member, right? So it doesn't necessarily has to have a, a bolt on the other side, okay? So that's a sort of a, 
the uh, difference here. But however, uh, you can always argue, you know, a boss is a kind of screw, right? Yeah. So for example, uh, this is what we're going to use for analysis here. Uh, we're going to use basically a bolt or screw to connect two members or multiple members. And uh, this is usually going to be uh, so-called uh, tension joints. Okay, so uh, our purpose is basically to analyze are we going to have a good joint at here, basically a stable joint, uh, not a failure ones, based on a proper selection of a bolt. Okay, so for this one here, and this is going to be what we call it. This is a called bolt, according to our definition, and this is what we should call it a screw at here. Okay, yeah. The type of fasteners, okay, uh, we can see this whether it's a tapered shank or non-tapered shank. If it's a tapered shank, so generally drywall and concrete or sheet wall screw. So basically, you wanted to uh, facilitate the screw into that member, right? And for non-tapered, non uh, it can be eyeballs or machine screws or cap screws. You always use a screw, maybe a bolt. You're gonna use the bolt, use a use a bolt with a nut. So there are different kind of uh, shapes of nut here. And this is the typical uh, dimension of a nut. And uh, for this one here, there's a washer uh, surface. Okay, so this washer face right here. Where very important uh, parameter for a bolt is H. Okay, is H. So uh, bring the table that I give it to you uh, today and the next lecture. Uh, we're going to use uh, tables to find uh, uh, um, appropriate numbers or values for different elements. Okay, yeah. And this is a double chamfer of nut, and this one here is a jam nut with a washer surface, and this is a jam nut with a double chamfer on both sides here. So jam nut is a it's a kind of a nut. Uh, you basically use it on a regular nut, so that you can prevent this uh, loose because of the vibration. Okay, this is actually uh, a practice. Whether so, how do you use the jam nut? Do you use the jam nut at the bottom of the regular nut, or do you use the jam nut on the top of the regular nut? So, I have a video, but I don't have time now. And the people did some experiments. It's better actually to use the jam nut at the bottom of the, the, of the regular nut. So, so, apply the jam nut first, and then the regular nut next. Right? Yeah. Uh, there are different kind of nuts that are here. Okay, this hex nut, vein nut. Okay, there's the castle nut. Okay. And uh, this is a so-called self-locking nuts. Self-locking basically because there's certain kind of a nylon uh, inside here. Okay, yeah. So you can reuse. You cannot reuse this. So once you use, you can reuse this. You also use a washer together with the nut. Whether or not sometimes you don't use the washer, but if you use a washer, uh, the purpose is basically to provide more consistent bearing surface. Okay, or loading surface. Okay, between the nut and the member. Uh, between the bolt and head and the, and the member. Uh, there is this helical spring type of a lock nut, and it's it's basically because there's a little spring type of action, and uh, it can uh, provide more friction, so basically provide better uh, mechanism to prevent it from uh, loosening. The uh, star kind of a nut, this is also called shake proof uh, kind of a nut, uh, 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 washer, okay? Uh, it, it has a certain kind of a teeth set here, okay? Either uh, internal or external. So the teeth will bite into the member and provide this also same uh, capacity, same ability to prevent uh, loosening here. But uh, because of this thing here, okay, but you gotta be careful basically because it bites into the member and uh, uh, you need to basically uh, think about the stress concentration, the surface condition, the corrosion, right, if you use this kind of a uh, uh, shake proof uh, washer. And the other thing is, once you use this one now, and you can reuse that because the teeth will uh, become flattened, right? It doesn't return uh, back to normal, right? Okay. So uh, this is basically. Uh, let's stop here. And in the next lecture, so we're going to look at the stiffness of the nut, the uh, stiffness of the screw, and the stiffness of the member, and we'll analyze the safety.